Having a discussion of inflation in hand from the aggregate supply aggregate demand model, we can now turn to the question what the Phillips curve got right and what it got wrong. Beginning with the original version, this idea that unemployment is negatively correlated with inflation, uh, you need to understand that early in the 20th century, in practically all countries, inflation on average has been around zero. I'll show you the data of that in a few minutes. Uh, but in terms of theory, what this implies is that someone in 1950 wouldn't have expected that the inflation rate next year would be positive. Rather, in terms of a model prior to the 1970s, really, but definitely prior to the 1950s, expected inflation would have been zero. This changes our dynamic version of the aggregate supply curve to inflation is equal to mu plus c minus alpha times ut. In other words, if inflation is unexpected, actual inflation rates in any given year are only a negative function of unemployment. If the unemployment rate is low, bargaining power is high, wages will go up, inflation will be higher, and vice versa. That's really the main intuition here. It follows from aggregate supply. Low unemployment increases bargaining power that drives normal wages up, drives firm costs up, and prices. So for instance, if the aggregate demand curve shifts to the right, you see an initial increase in prices, We've been over that a couple of times, but you should review it if you don't remember. And then as prices increase, expected prices increase as well, which causes the aggregate supply curve to shift to the left. And that brings us closer to the natural level of output. In this world, if that's all there is, a decrease in the unemployment rate will cause higher inflation next year, which is consistent with the Phillips curve. Now, needless to say, something changed in the 1970s. And perhaps the most significant change was that the U.S. gave up the Bretton Woods system. It abandoned the gold standard. A consequence of that is that monetary policy shifted dramatically. In the first half of the 20th century, the money supply had been bound by the gold supply, so it was basically fixed. Starting in the 1970s, when we moved into fiat currencies, central banks started expanding the money supply. On top of that, the 1970s had two pretty significant supply-side shocks. The first one was the 1973 oil embargo in consequence of the Yom Kippur War, where the Arab members of the OPEC, the Organization for Petroleum Exporting Countries, banned imports of oil to the United States. That significantly caused shortages in the U.S. It drove up the price of oil and gasoline, and because oil is such an important input in the production of and shipping of pretty much anything, it caused an aggregate supply side shock. Now, if the aggregate supply side moves, if the aggregate supply curve shifts to the left, uh, we, we see two things. For one, we see lower production. We see an increase in unemployment. But because production cost is increased, we also see an increase in prices. And that, needless to say, suggests a positive relationship between inflation and unemployment, a scenario that is sometimes referred to as stagflation, and that's inconsistent with the Phillips curve, which states the opposite. But even if this aggregate supply shift hadn't occurred, the change in monetary policy, this increase in the money supply, helped shifting up inflation consistently, and that too broke the original Phillips curve for reasons we'll discuss. Now, first things first, let me show you the data. This is the relationship between inflation rates and unemployment in the United States from 1970 to 2008. I will show you more up-to-date data in the next segment. Now, what happened, as opposed to Philip's original observation, was that in years where unemployment was low, inflation was low as well. And then in years where unemployment is high, the inflation rate was a little bit higher. A lot of this stuff goes back to the 70s, these really high inflation rates, near 10%, near 8%. We're not so used to that anymore because in recent decades, inflation has been largely under control. But it is pretty clear that this is not a negative relationship. Now, what had happened? This is the inflation rate from 1914 to 2020. And that basically illustrates what I had mentioned originally. Up until 1970, up until here, inflation rates were sometimes very positive, they were sometimes very negative. And if you draw sort of a mean line through this, you would find that they were approximately zero. Once we abandoned the gold standards, central banks started printing money that caused consistent inflation. And inflation in the second half of the 20th century, up until 2009, was always positive, and it still remains positive on average since. What's the implication? Well, the first half of the 20th century, we had high variation inflation rates, frequent deflation, average inflation rates were about zero. 
In the second half of the 20th century, we saw much less variation in inflation rates, very little deflation, and average inflation rates were about 2 to 3 percent. Reason for that, as mentioned, was a change in the money supply. What does this imply for inflation expectations? Well, if you know that there is inflation, you're going to come to expect it. Usually this is a point where I ask the class what they think inflation rates will be, and normally they say something like 2 or 3 percent. The reason why you answer this way is because that's your experience. Inflation tends to be slightly positive, even if it's recently slowed down a bit. But for someone in 1940, that wouldn't have necessarily been the case. Sometimes inflation was very high, sometimes it was very low, so they wouldn't have had the same sort of expectation that the next year would bring stable inflation. Now, let's count, account for this way of, of thinking. Um, one way to think about what something's going to be tomorrow is what we call adaptive expectations. Adaptive expectations, in essence, just state that I think what happened today is going to happen tomorrow. In terms of expected inflation, this might mean that what you think inflation is going to be next year is equal to what inflation was this year times some parameter theta. Theta could be 1, in which case you would just expect that inflation next year is equal to this year's expected inflation, or it could be something else. It could be, for instance, half of it. It doesn't really matter. It's just a coefficient. Assuming adaptive expectations, our dynamic aggregate supply curve then changes a little bit. Inflation in this case is equal to some function of last year's inflation plus mu plus c minus alpha times uv. It's still a negative function of unemployment, but it is also a function of what inflation was because we think what inflation was yesterday is going to affect inflation today. The easiest case here, and this is plausible if you have stable inflation, if it doesn't change too much from year to year, is setting theta equal to 1. In that case, inflation today is equal to last year's inflation plus mu plus c minus alpha times ut. And I can slightly reorganize that, and what I get is that the change in inflation from one year to the next is equal to mu plus c minus alpha ut. Now, this relationship is sometimes referred to as the expectations augmented Phillips curve or the modified Phillips curve. What it does, it states that it's not the level of inflation that is a function of unemployment, it's in fact the change in inflation that's a function of unemployment. If the unemployment rate increases, the change in inflation declines. That means inflation becomes slower. It was 2% last year, this per year is just going to be 1.5%, for instance. If the unemployment rate declines by contrast, real wages start to catch up, that accelerates inflation. Now, why is there always some inflation? Because we expect it, right? If the unemployment rate doesn't change at all, then inflation is simply equal to what it was last year. If labor markets become tighter, inflation accelerates. If labor markets become looser, if there's more slack, inflation decelerates. Now, empirically, what you have here is the unemployment rate in the United States since the 1970s and a change in inflation. And lo and behold, the augmented Phillips curve fits this data pretty well. In years where the unemployment rate is lower, inflation tends to increase by more. In years where the unemployment rate is higher, inflation tends to decelerate. And this augmented Phillips curve is still an input into policy decisions, although again, last 10 years were a little bit different. We'll come back to that point. You can estimate this using a simple regression technique. If you had econometrics, you should be familiar with the concept. If not, I'll just give you the estimate here. Um, the implied rate of change of inflation in this graph I just showed you on an annual basis is about 6% per year minus 0.04 times the unemployment rate a year to year. Now, this is not necessarily the best way to estimate this. The actual coefficients vary with the time period you use. They vary a little bit with the definition of inflation that you use. But it drives home the general point. If there's always some inflation, it will be lower if unemployment rate is if the unemployment rate is high, and it will be higher if the unemployment rate becomes very low. And this argument, as I mentioned before, is the modified expected expectations augmented, or sometimes the accelerationist Phillips curve. Now it turns out that this definition is what is often used to estimate the natural rate of unemployment, which will be our discussion 